I started questioning things, uh, they might ask my first uh, pasture pipeline. I called, called both of us at the time to go ahead, plow it in, send us the bill. And later on, they, they finance some more. They get perimeter cost 100% on perimeter cross fencing, interior cross fencing. Have numerous partners like that. And I started questioning other things on as it progressed. All of a sudden, Rick Warburst, Ducks Unlimited, delivered some uh, lentil seed to me so I could do some what I called nurse cropping. And I'll get into some of that later, not just companion cropping. And state extension, Sheridan County agent. At the time, I live in McLean County. We started rubbing elbows and got to know each other. And I mentioned to him about what I thought I was observing on the prairie. And we took a, borrowed, he borrowed a neighbor's truck in Sheridan County and we went to Canada and brought home some field pea seed. That was the state extension, Ducks Unlimited, state NRCS, which was then SCS. I believe Trisha was in Towner at the time, with early days of, with Jeff Prince being my mentor and technical assistance provider. And the list goes on for, and I also, and ARS, I, I view them as a valuable partner for information when I have questions. And I, I view science as a tool for, to assist my art of management. And that's my accolades for partnering. <laughs> okay. Well, I guess I have it here. Uh, Dane thought I needed a disclaimer on here. <laughs> 40 years of sniffing grass <laughs> have adverse effects leading to balding. <laughs> he said I needed something for attention grabber. <laughs> but really, I'm not sniffing grass. This is part of my monitoring. I take that duff layer, that surface layer of the soil, and I rub it, crush it in my palm of my hand, and, and I take a sniff. And depending on the pleasantness of it, or very pungent unflavoredness of it, that's uh, my way of monitoring fungal bacterial ratios. And I think everybody can do it. The, the more pleasant the aroma, the, the healthier the soil. Very simple monitoring, you don't need expensive equipment. Another one, that six inch length pieces of old six inch grain auger tubing, that's my water infiltration data testing. I do that periodically. Tap it in three inches if you can, then pour an inch of water in it, 15 ounces or 444 milliliters, and time how long it takes for it to, the last drop to soak in. Simple. Simple monitoring. The shovel, the, that's uh, started in the early days, early 1980s. That's one of my most valuable monitoring tools. There I started checking uh, rooting depth, uh, doing a plug of soil roots. The next one is just monitoring aggregate structure. And I did have the the uh, honor for a few years of being on uh, Dr. Chris Nichols' uh, peer review papers before they were published. And to me, that was an honor. I don't have a degree, but I learned a lot from that. I'm not sure what slides are up because I don't have a screen in front of me. Yeah. It used to be a season-long grazer. Well, anyway, down in the lower right, that would be the annual spring pasture. Did that for years, and then the bigger pasture on the left. That was in later May into June till there was nothing left. Maybe into November. Typical season-long grazing, and then back home on the west side or to the right. And then it would be some fall grazing and early feeding. 
started getting tired of that. Why am I working harder and harder to make less and less? In 13 years of that, and then 1980, I started hearing a four-pasture twice over. Sounded good. Put in some cross fencing, four pasture twice over on the left side. It's actually five, but one real tiny one. And it was moving by the calendar. And it worked. At the time I got away from that, did more cross fencing. I was had increased about 12%, 112% of monitoring, started monitoring in pounds of beef per acre. I don't care about the size of the cow, 1,000 pound cow, 1,500, or the size of the calf. Started monitoring in how many pounds of beef per acre. Everybody knows bushels. So I was selling, I was selling pounds, not head. If, work, if I'd have kept on with that, I would estimate I probably would have leveled off at 120% increase in productivity. Okay. Well, something, some of the slides got mixed up here, it didn't enter in right. But anyway, then I started hearing a cell grazing eight paddock level cell grazing, 32 day rotation. Well, that sounds like magic. There's more, a little more cross fencing and it sounds politically correct. It was funded and promoted. And 32 day rotation on eight paddock level, that's only 28 days rest recovery. Do that about four or five times in the season. And I started looking at us, I'm going to head to disaster. Not enough rest recovery. Then there's... Okay. Then I started hearing of Ellen Savory and Ballistic Resource Management was called in. Then a group of us got up to get, come to Bismarck here and we did a five and a half day course with them. Was it November 1986, Steve? $1,500 then for five and a half days. And those of you who think $200 is too much for a three day course, I advise everybody to take one of those courses. I think Steve would agree with me, John Linnaeus. We all went back home and never looked back. I went home and it was dead of winter, or going through the winter, I put in together a production statement. What do I want? What do I need? We wanted sustained profits from crops and livestock and to have a cultural and aesthetic surroundings. And that means good neighbors too, the whole community, not just my own land. Then also I put together a, what I call the, my visionscape, what I wanted my soil, my land to look like. I wanted non-eroding soil with high complexity of life and high organic content. This is this guy's is my roadmap. I wanted the organic content to, in the cropland, especially in the cropland, to be at least five percent or higher. We've achieved that. It used to be in the low ones to maybe at the best two two. Nutrient cycling. We wanted to be high in with minimum losses to leaching and erosion. I'm going to go over some of these fast. We wanted almost all nutrients to be supplied by the life, the soil, life, and atmosphere. And I want to emphasize I, sh I should have erased almost, because I'm, now I want all nutrients to be supplied. I don't want to have to go to the company and buy a fertilizer. That's money going out. And water cycle to be very efficient to minimize erosion. I didn't want nutrients and dollars running downstream. This one is the one I monitor the most. I feel if this one's in place, everything else is also. Every raindrop should be captured where it falls. Well, I've pretty much achieved that. At best, we used to 
We used to have one eight to one point four average infiltration rate. This is on my native prairie now, not my crop land. Now our forest is six, and it's, the highest is up over 10, 12. And Jerry, you're seeing that too, it's improving. It's really neat to go out right after rainfall and you can hear that water trickling in the soil profile. You don't see anything on the surface. Water that does run off, we want it to run clear. It's taking nutrient load with it, that's dollars going downhill. Energy flow, that's our my ability to harvest sunlight. Want it to be high and sustained to livestock, crops, soils, soil health, and wildlife. When I'm talking soil health, I'm talking all those creatures living in the soil. This I'm going to throw in a couple of that remember that rock? It's a marker. This is no cross fencing. This is 10 years later. There's that rock. Diversity's coming in. This was after being grazed, even though it's a month earlier in the season. And it wasn't touched, and it wouldn't be touched again for maybe 12 to 15 months. This is 27 years after cross fencing, even though it's a different site. This is as the telephoto lens was used from the from the dog to that tree that that dug out. It's a little over a quarter mile, but it's a it's a swale coming uphill. We're at the right at the top of the hill. See how even the big blue stem has slowly crept up the hill to the top of the hill, and even in the corner, in the bottom corner, bottom left corner. They're little blue stem, little blue stem, big blue stem, purple prairie coneflower, and a lot of other plants, silver leaf, scurf pea. All of a sudden, they're all in a community together versus separate in the landscape. That means the water infiltration is moving uphill and capturing raindrops at the top of the hill. They're not eroding the nutrients downhill. For a desired landscape, we what did we need? We put we put together the Jeff Prince to help. Then he was state range con. No, he wasn't even state range con then. He was still in Minot. Uh, if we wanted to improve plant health, greater plant diversity, deeper roots, more effective nutrient cycle, covered soil, and again, more effective water cycle. They're all intertwined. You can't have one without the other. And then we put in, a, what do we have in the toolbox? Rest is a tool, rest recovery. I haven't exactly defined yet what is minimum adequate rest, but that's that sort of a varying factor. Prescribed burning is a tool. I prefer not to use it if I have, absolutely don't have to, because I feel burning is a carbon release lost up into the atmosphere. I like to use livestock as a tool that hoof to trample down that standing vegetation, getting it in periodically and get it in contact with the soil microbes. The soil microbes have a very low browse line, they can't reach up to get it. So I have to put it down to them. And time and timing, where the livestock are when as a tool to achieve the desired outcome of what I want to achieve on the landscape. Started doing more cross fencing after I went back after we went back home from the November '86 uh, holistic resource management. Now it's just holistic management, and started thinking putting more cross fencing in. Sold the creep feeder. I haven't used a creep feeder since 1986. To me, that's to me. If I have to use a creep feeder, I'm subsidizing my grassland. I also have another saying of mine, the grass and the soil, the soil bugs and the soil come first, the cow comes second. I'll feed, I feed the soil first, the cow second, because I cannot raise any more forage. And I'll say the word forage, 
right now, but I'll say grasses again. When I say grasses, I'm referring to everything out there, the forbs, the broadleaves, not just the grasses. There might be racial plant species-wise, there might be five forb species for every grass type species. Even though there might be about 200, up to 200 species or more in a given area the size of this room. Putting in a lot more cross fencing, I have more water line development. And this is permanent cross fencing and I do temporary cross fencing within permanent cross fencing. A two wire electric, one hot, one ground, 10 to 12 inches apart. Is there any clo closer when deer go through and tangles, they don't unwrap themselves. And uh, yeah, I have, okay, I'll have them moves. And I'll put this in. Fencing can be fun. For those are saying, ah, oh, it's too much work. How long does it take to fence a quarter of land that has no fence on it or put a crop or even put some temporary cross fencing across subdividing a permanent cross fencing? I can, I can fence a quarter of, of land in less than two hours. I made this one winter evening, it was 20 below, and like the temperatures are out now. I walked out to pasture and got a the little electric motor drive off the candy box from the old cultivator that I sort of abandoned because I was pretty much strict no to zero tiller now. Took that electric gear driven motor and made this contraption and mounted that little electric drive on there. In the center one with the it has the yellow poly wire there. I can just flip a switch and driving along I don't have to crank anymore or you even use the uh, a cordless drill, two to seven miles an hour I can drive along and it's winding up and I smile every time I use it. <laughs> and I will say, uh, at the time I built it and I checked into getting a, tried to get a patent on it, it would have been twenty-eight to thirty-two thousand dollars to get a patent and I figured that's crazy. <laughs> And a little later, mentioned it to Terry Gumpert from Nebraska State Extension, some of you know him. And he says, would you consider putting it on public domain that everybody can copy it, but nobody can patent it. So I did that. And now Dane Bicey suggested of DU could come out and I don't have a blueprint. It was just something I pictured in my mind when I built it. And it came together in 12 hours time. And so we might be coming up with Dane Bicey and his fellow DU staff to uh, draw blueprints and everybody can design and build their own. But I don't want any profiting by marketing the concept and design. And capturing every raindrop where it falls, I concentrated more on that because it's just more simplified monitoring. And if things aren't simple, I tend not to do them. If they get too complex, I forget it. This was a, I was in contact during the 80s and with Dr. Jimmy Richardson and Soil Science Department at North Dakota State. And uh, we had, it says four inches of rain overnight. 1988, 89, up until July 3rd, 1990, we didn't have four inches of rain in two and a half years. I was, I was hauling water, you know, I had more cross fencing, I had grass, I was running more cattle than I did in the average good years previous to cross fencing, but I didn't have water. You know, so I had to haul water and that's, those of you who have done it, it takes a lot of time and expense. And uh, morning of July 5th, I called the soil science department at NDSU and says, where's my water? We just had four inches of rain, the flash rain, and the neighboring ponds are full to the point even some fences washed out. I said, I don't have any water. The next morning at eight o'clock, Dr. Richardson was knocking at my door, came 250 miles. <laughs> and we went out and he says, you just, I think you're just achieving 
capturing those raindrops. And I was told previous to that it was impossible, couldn't be done. Uh, why water infiltration? At the time, the later 80s or night, early 90s, we, Jimmy Richardson and I put this together. Why water infiltration? We made it basic, four flows of water in the landscape. Surface flow, that's what's running off the surface. Second flow, infiltration. Third flow, what's flowing through the soil profile. And both these arrows are running downhill. It's simple, water goes downhill in the landscape, not just on the surface. And then, then reflow, and the infiltration through flow, reflow, that's the process that gives sustained flows to creek streams and rivers versus surface flow, flood and dry. Why water infiltration? I have about four miles of public shoreline, and this is Crooked Lake. And where I'm standing down to the shoreline is maybe 120 yards. I don't want it to run away and, and take nutrient load into the water. And that's dollars washing away. I want it to soak in. And then 100, 120 yards, it might take five to 10 days before it gets to the lake instead of immediate flood and dry. Effective rainfall, we get an inch of rain, am I only using 20 or two tenths of an inch or am I using half inch or am I using all of it for growth? The running depth has already been mentioned, but also include, there's a lot of different characteristic roots, shallow running, deeper running from different plants, use more of the soil profile, the rest recovery. If it come back too soon before that plant that has been grazed and it tries to initiate regrowth, if it has had more than 50% of its leaf removed, it takes a long time for it to be able to initiate growth and to be able to put the money back in this piggy bank that it had to borrow to initiate growth. early 80s I started doing some of this. I started flagging and monitoring plants that had been grazed, trying to determine adequate minimum rest recovery. And that's an ongoing challenge. This is a native prairie, the native plants, which is be a different ball game than introduced tame species of grass. Because there's so many different species in there, warm season, cool season, and with degrees within the warm season, cool season. I put it to, I'll do a very, my planning, I'll do very slow moves. Might take a year to 15 months to get around to where I had started. But if we get more rapid growth, then I can speed up. I might have only have 60 days rest recovery then. But if I plan 60 days and all of a sudden, oops, it's dry, nothing's growing, I have to stretch out to 100, 120 days rest, then I can potentially be caught in accelerated grazing, which means I have to move because there's nothing left, and ones in front haven't had enough rest recovery. Uh, the shovel, that, that's just some soil plugs. We started pulling uh, very shallow. Here's another one, March 28th. 2005, Jeff Prince asked if I could go out to some CRP and collect some soil plugs for him. I called him, so Jeff, I can't. There's the ice right at the surface. I, all, all I could get down was an inch by heavy chipping with the shovel. But then I also went back to my native prairie, which has had at this point 25 years of planned rotational grazing. And and I do a one jump test with my shovel. How far does it penetrate with one jump? And it went in to about 15 inches. 25 minutes later, you know, winter snow melt, when the snow melts, where's that water going? And that stagnant CRP, it was running away. 
Here's another better example. Three to four inches of is a 19 year arrested CRP. Same average grass running depth as heavy season as years of heavy season long grazing. Three to four inches. Just reflecting that ice right at the surface and the water running away. The other, this was uh, 20, this was actually 27 years after the, it was quantified with science, soil scientists out there with the backhoe. Improved the, at grass running depth from 3 to 4 inches, we went, improved it to 12 to 40 inches. But it's, it's deeper now, so. Because I'm, last, I just completed my 40th year of cross fencing. And also monitoring surface soil temps. This is interesting. Surface soil temps at 70 degrees, 100% of the moisture you have there is available for plant growth. I'll go up to surface soil temps in July or August. If it's 100 degrees surface soil temps, only 15% of the moisture that's there is available for plant growth. The rest is being lost through evaporation and, and transpiration. I won't go any further there, but get a hundred and there's, I think there's identifying now some other things that are, but keeping the soil covered, keeping it cooler. Everybody is probably walking your kid in bare feet and burned your feet because it was pretty doggone hot, 130, 140 degrees. But even, even as a kid, I tried frying eggs on hot rocks and, <laughs> and sometimes it sort of worked. Yeah. But we're losing the soil mi soil microbe by having bare soil and getting it too hot. There's another one I started doing. This is the early '80s salt and mineral placement. Three days after this, put the salt block in there. Just monoculture brush, winter snowberry. What most people call it buck brush. Open it up with providing an attractant so. That and livestock and go in and open it up. Me on the other side of the buffalo, buffalo berry bush there, yeah. It was just an example of using that other salt block. Here's the same site, that circle, where the salt block was 20 years before. It's still open. No additional chem attractants. And notice the open, the monoculture brush, how it opened up around it just by changing management without chemicals. I still want the brush there, deeper rutting, helps in nutrient cycling, everything, adding diversity. Winter bale grazing has been discussed here today, and I won't cover much on that, the techniques of it. I hear, oh, you're getting lazy, you don't even, rook. I've been told this. Oh, you're lazy, you don't even roll your bales out. It's too much bale waste. Well, here's a hillside that I, this was not rolled out hay, this was just bales sitting there that I set and set out and moved away. Like, so the picture here, one, there was seven different bales sitting within that picture there. This was uh, like middle, later December. I've been doing this for about 28 years. Here's another picture of that previous one of just over the hill <coughs> to the right. And I put, took this picture deliberately, the pale yellow, and I took it and I turned around without moving. There a bale had sat the previous winter. See that ring? People, a lot of them say there's so much bale waste. Here's where that bale sat. There is no bale waste, period. It's bale litter feeding the soil. Even though some of this was on native prairie, I would not advise doing mature grown grass. A, it has viable seeds or anything in it. Some of this was just simple slough hay, cattail stuff and sedges. I knew that would never have a chance on the higher ground. 
Here's the result by flipping and weighing. Some of you have done that, it's tedious. 400 to 650% increase in productivity compared to the behind me. I defy anybody to say I'm wasting hay under this type of management. It's easy. Take the bale out there, set it down, go home. Do a minimum of three days hay supply. That way all the animals have choice picking. They all clean up. Uh, five years, my wife is from Germany. Five years ago he went to Germany. I set enough out for 30 days. We were gone three weeks. I came home and didn't have to feed hay till the 38th day after the feeding. Who wants to take time and roll out a hay bale? Why is anybody feeding in the corral? Here's another one, started monitoring. Been close, I think it's 28 years since I've used systemic porons like Ivomex. Started thinking, why am I using systemic chemicals to kill off insects that are working for me? This was in October. This is the same cow pie. I flagged it so I could find it. It was a day old when I took the picture, first picture. Second picture was three days later with the dung beetles working. It was just a pile of dried up sawdust left. Those insects love this. They love their Slurpees. <laughs> and they're also taking those nutrients from the Slurpees and taking it down into the soil, nutrient cycling. And I'm also coming to think that there may be also the ultimate superhero in the process of taking their dung down in. I have burrowers that have never seen much of any rollers. They're taking it down. Are they also gathering up some native seeds along the way and taking it down deeper for a future seed bank? But let me know on your thoughts on that. You know, neighbors think I'm lost it a long time ago. <laughs> Parasite control. We have found that those cow pies, a fresh cow pie out of a cow is still killing off insects up to 70 days to 90 days after Ivomectoron, even though the label now says what, 47? Do you agree seeing that also? Maybe even longer. The label is wrong. Why do I want to kill off an insect that's working for me? If they're taking that pile of dung and taking it to a pile of dried up sawdust or even disappear in season in July, June, July, August, three days time if I have a cow pie left, there's something wrong. I took this picture, these animals came in. I do custom grazing now. I don't, I don't allow any type of insecticide porons on those animals minimum of 60 days before they come in. And the defy, they have a hard time finding a fly on these animals. This was taken, uh, not last year, this is 2018 it was taken. Part of my strategy of planned rotational grazing is skipping paddocks. If they're here, start getting an anticipated fly build, not just the fly build up, but internal insects, worm, tapeworms, other worms. Move, leave a distance behind. Put a gap in there. A sort of, sort of chaos management that isn't neat. Just don't go around and around like a clockwork. Go to the next best one. And from here, I might go up to there, then start the next one, and then all of a sudden go. And identifying the weak, uh, weak link using biological planning. The internal parasite that has passes through in, in the dung, 
most likely it's an egg or a casting. It has to germinate whatever. It's an infant. It's at a very critical stage of its life. It crawls up on a stem of a plant, waiting for an animal to come by and pick it up again, the grazing, to repeat the cycle through the animal system. If an animal isn't there in that critical stage of its life, that little creature dies. Don't need chemical. Chemical is just Im impeding my nutrient mineral cycle. I've also dotted lines up there in the green, that's crop land. I have water tanks along the line, plowing in pipeline, working terrain, because it's sort of hilly. So I can do multiple different combinations of grazing crop aftermath, etc. Even not just cover crop, but just plain crop aftermath grazing behind the combine. We have Okay. All these dotted lines up in the green, we've taken just for just curiosity's sakes and fence off part of a, the grain stubble after the combine and keep the livestock off that part and just without cover crops and graze the other part. Guess what? The very next year, I rent the cropland out now and got a few brothers that rented from me. They want livestock on their cropland. They said, uh, just simple, without any cover crop additional enhancements, the yield monitor bounces up and down at least three bushel an acre difference, three bushel an acre benefit to where the cattle had been the fall before. Without any cover crops, companion cropping. Well, what is, what is wheat prices? Five dollars? That's fifteen dollars an acre benefit to have them on the cropland a year before. For those that say, ah, oh, cattle on there are compacting the soil. There's a, a quote I use from Dr. Dwayne Beck. Monitor native prairie for better understanding of cropland soil health. I throw this in because it isn't, because that's what I thought I was seeing going up to 1990. I started doing this what I call companion cropping. Started putting oats and field peas together and I started monitoring so the maturity dates were pretty similar, preferably oats is a few days ahead of the peas because the peas easily shattered. Then I would harvest them, combine them, not just for hay. Make an excellent feed grain for backgrounding feeder calves, feeder lambs, which you used to have sheep. Matthew used to have sheep when he was in high school. And Dr. Jimmy Ritzerton came out on a tour where he would show up every once in a while, took him out to a site and I said, Jimmy, what's going on here? And he started dancing. And it was a natrix site, heavy gumbo site. And he got all excited. Guess what? We had to go get a backhoe. And here's what he came up with. Oats and field peas together versus either alone at up to a 4x deeper rooting. Bioculture versus monoculture. Cover cropping, get 8, 10, 12, 15 different species together, then it's a whole nother jump in the ballgame. This was July 1990. Here's some deep, the, the field peas were ex state extension, I had to pay for them. Ducks Unlimited through the gave me the lentils, I'm putting 10, 12 pounds of lentils in the fertilizer box and I was seeding sunflowers in 1990. Trying to see what was going, I could do in the cropland what I thought I was seeing in the native prairie. And guess what, it worked. The lentils, I put this as a nurse crop. Lentils providing the nitrogen to the sunflowers. Worked beautiful. Had about the same yield, gross yield, on the back half of the field where I had the lentils. At the time, I wasn't brave enough to do it across the whole field where the, all the neighbors could be driving by and see it. 
<laughs> but it was about the same. Well, it was within 30 pounds of difference of being the same yield. Here's what we finally come up with. I did a few years of this. Bioculture versus monoculture, companion cropping and nurse cropping. 25 to 32 percent better bottom line versus monoculture. So I kept on doing stuff like this. And I got more involved, more detailed cover crops. Here's another one I started doing. I did this in year 2000. Had a brainstorm, or a, some would say, bug up to it. <laughs> well, I had some winter wheat. And I took it off. Instead of broadcasting fertilizer out there in the, in the spring, and started breaking dormancy. I figured, oh, I'm going to try something different. Again, the lentils can provide the nitrogen, thinking, why should I buy fertilizer and I can pull it out of the air? And I threw some turnip and radish in also, and it was a pretty good crop. I didn't do any check strips anymore, but a neighbor was watching, and he called me over and he says, hey, he says, you, you notice your turnips are disappearing? further and further into the field from this gate. He says, and us neighbors are all pulling your turnips, checking them. Then he says, look at here. Here's a little spot with just, just lentils and no winter wheat. Monoculture lentils up to 30 days before it started nodulating. He says, look at here. They've only been up five days where it was together with Lentils were together with the winter wheat. Five days and they had viable pink nodules. I don't know what's going on, but plants behave different in, when they're together versus alone. Five days versus 30, that's an additional 25 days of once we see, if we were seeing things correct, additional 25 days of pulling in from the air. Well, that's just some of the things, wild bug things I've been doing. It's sort of a, I could have said it the one sentence right away and went home. Uh, all I figure I do anymore is manage diversity for soil health enhancement. Feed the soil and then everything else takes care of itself. Uh, this is why I keep on doing what I'm doing. I mentioned 25, 32% increase in productivity. Things have gotten better in the cropland since then. But my native prairie, about a 450% increase in, in forage productivity on a per acre basis compared to my old season long grazing. And I'd like to leave more behind now than we used to raise total before. Remember I said I got to have to feed the soil first, the cow second. So we're actually doing about 300 to 345% more pounds of beef per acre compared to what we used to do. No additional acreage. I actually dropped all the rented land. Figured I can do more acres going down versus out. And this is really what it's all about. I enjoy doing what I'm doing. And believe me, that diaper on my grandson there holds a lot of raindrops. <laughs> <laughs> and it also captures carbon. <laughs> He's 18 years old now, by the way, <laughs> and he just scored, he scored a 35 in his ACT, and he just got accepted a full scholarship right to John Hopkins. So that diaper absorbed a, a lot of nutrients. But that's my story of a 40-year journey in 40 minutes. We'll just take a couple questions for Gene, quick ones, and then we're going to set up the panel real quick, and then we'll go through that real quick. So, any quick questions for Gene? 